29-year-old man <laughs> with his first felony conviction. Started as a deferred judgment and sentence and was based on uh, a series of communications with the public that were open to the judge um, that were uh, threatening in nature, violent in nature, and that frightened the judge. With respect to the harm in this case, um, I, the closest analogy I could possibly present to, to show people understand um, the harm to harm to the with the victim is Bonnie's law, the stalking law. And in the General Assembly's um, sort of uh, exposition with respect to stalking laws, one of the things that they talk about is how uh, stalking behavior means that a victim is not safe anywhere. Not only does it remove their sense of uh, anonymity or security in, in places as benign as a grocery store or a stoplight or a bus stop, but it removes the sense of safety in someone's home. Uh, as the court is aware, Mr. Brand obviously is an activist and cares very much about constitutional rights. One of the constitutional rights that is most guarded um, is the sanctity of the home. We saw that, I think, in the Kylo case with that peacekeeping device that the Supreme Court says was inappropriate because it violated the sanctity of the home. This conduct, um, while words um, and while threats that were not acted upon, violates the sanctity of the victim's home. It violates her sense of security and safety no matter where she goes. And that is really unfortunate no matter who you're talking about, right? It doesn't matter the personal characteristics of the victim. Um, the fact that someone's robbed of a sense of enjoyment in their life is problematic. In this particular situation, it is particularly problematic or particularly pernicious um, because of the characteristics of the victim. Ted Delgado is a public servant. Um, he worked in Boulder County as a district attorney, uh, and she wor she's worked in Adams County as a judge for quite some years. She's not, uh, she is a, a minority woman. She, uh, she is small in stature, and she is uh, big-minded. That is to say, uh, she actively engages with problem-solving courts. Judge Delgado is not the problem in the system. I'm not going to stand before this court and tell you that there aren't problems in the system, that there aren't reasons for protesters and for actions um, like Mr. Brandt, um, you know, has called for or changes that Mr. Brandt has called for. I, I fully admit that we can always do better. We always should do better. But judges like Judge Delgado, who seek a new way, who seek a different way, who engage in mental health court, they're not the problem. And so there, there are sort of two issues in terms of victim impact with this offense. Not only generally what is taken from a person, but in particular this person, a public service uh, servant committed to making sure that we all live in a better place. Um, I know the court, and as the court has been with me uh, on this case with all of us since the very beginning, and in fact, that through the co-defendant trial. Uh, I usually like to start my sentencing arguments by sort of previewing my act or my prayer. In this case, I'm not asking for prison. Uh, in this case, I'm asking for community-based supervision. And I want to make that clear up front, in, in not only so that the court can sort of hear my words in relation to that, but I also think it's necessary to address what I think would be disparate treatment between co-defendants. As the court is aware, uh, Mr. Brandt was in charge in the vacuum. He was charged together with a co-defendant, Adrian Brown. I don't think if the cases were ever formally joined. Um, and that is likely to do with the fact that there were differences in conduct. Um, Mr. Brandt engaged in, in you know, unfortunate, um, threatening words on the Internet, on a Facebook page. Um, and then he uh, picketed outside of the courthouse with an effigy of Judge Delgado hanging from a noose. Adrian Brown was in a different position in a couple of ways. Um, one, not only was he a personally threatening, that is to say, in close proximity to the judge, but he was also up on her bench, 
near uh, photographs of her family um, and making threats that appear to be related specifically to those photos. Uh, while Mr. Branch obviously is appearing before this court on his first felony, uh, Mr. Brown was subject to the strictures of the two prior felony rules, given uh, a very long criminal history, some of which was violent. Um, specifically, the most concerning offense I think of uh, was an offense with a knife for menacing incident with a young lady um, that felt unsafe and frightened for her life at the hands of Mr. Brown. So, I wanted to acknowledge that I am advocating for disparate treatment between what I perceive to be co defendants With respect to uh, other things I think the court should consider, uh, the court is aware that Mr. Um, Grant has been on a deferred judgment and sentence with a diversion program in Jefferson County. His client manager is a man, is a man named Aaron Moon. Mr. Moon can be here today because of some personal tragedy, but I did ask him um, you know, what, what is the issue here? Um, what could we do better? What does Mr. Grant need? Um, several jurisdictions have obviously reached out to him to try to figure out, you know, is Mr. Grant compliant? Is he disruptive? Does he yell? Is he profane? None of those things. In our time supervising Mr. Grant, um, he has been polite, he has been appropriate, um, not only has he engaged in treatment as we've requested, um, but he actually signed himself up for more treatment uh, because he was excited about those opportunities. Um, when I talked to Mr. Moon about, you know, what is left, what else could we do, um, his, his suggestion was mental health. Um, it's unfortunate, I know we have looked at veterans court, both in this jurisdiction and, and uh, Jefferson County, and I think um, while Mr. Grant was accepted for veterans court in Jefferson County, there's no mechanism to sentence him to veterans court here to be supervised in Jefferson County. I did look into that. Um, Adams County did deny him. Um, and I, I think there's probably a lot of reasons for that. I, I wasn't privy to that process. Um, but it's rather unfortunate because a problem solving court like that with a higher level of supervision that focuses on the deficiencies of the issues, specifically with that funding piece and that piece related to uh, veteran-specific treatment, would be so helpful. Uh, but we were not, unfortunately, going to proceed with that. Um, with respect to the personal characteristics of the offender here, um, obviously I've already gone through the offense itself, uh, Mr. Grant presents as a veteran. I think that's significant. Um, he, he is a man who served his country. Um, when, he, uh, when he returned to, I guess, civilian life, he was plagued by a homelessness. Um, whether, you know, it's a chicken and egg situation, I, I don't know what the get was, but we have a pattern of homelessness, um, drug abuse, and mental health issues. Um, and then a history of trauma, personal trauma for Mr. Grant in terms of his prior relationship. More than that, Mr. Grant, uh, just before the court, uh, a man who is a minority in the sense that he's a homosexual man. And I bring that up because um, I think that all of these personal characteristics go to the heart of the case. We have a man who uh, had some mental health issues a man who doesn't think and feel like everyone else, a man who committed himself to, to the service, to the armed service, for the benefit of other citizens. And he came back and he experienced hardship. And people who experience homelessness, people who experience hardship, are often invisible. And it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, someone like myself um, or the rest of society, you know, doesn't, is meaning to do any harm, it's easier to look away. But when you're voiceless and you're unseen and you feel different than and you're suffering from mental health issues and you've given uh, to your country and received sort of no uh, acknowledgement or return investment, that can be difficult. And so Mr. Brandt did something that I, I, I'm not particularly surprised about is after becoming unseen, he became angry and he engaged in protesting behavior. 
uh, he, he became a voice uh, and a, a spotlight for uh, abuses of power, for other folks who are unseen, that those people matter, that they should be seen. And I think all of that is fair and right and good. In our country, we have a long history of protesters, and they change the world for the better every single day. The issue came when Mr. Brandt, I think, ironically became the very thing he was fighting against. And, and here's what I mean by that. Uh, there is sort of that old adage or uh, sense that in humanity, because of human nature, the oppressed often becomes the oppressor. And in this situation, Mr. Brandt had uh, fair criticism about people in power. And he, he called out abuses of power. And as he did that with success, that is to say he was charged, and he didn't do what many other people do. Because when, when people protest, when they stand up, when they say, this isn't, this isn't okay, this isn't right, they pick up petty offenses. They pick up low-level misdemeanors. They pick up cases where the offer is two days credit time served close to case. And most people take that. Most people acknowledge some fault as they take the offer. It happens every day across the country. But Mr. Brandt, for reasons outside of himself, based on a warrior spirit, a commitment to not being unseen, said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to subject myself to months and months of bond conditions and a fight. And I'm going to stand up and I'm going to say this isn't okay every single day. And I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And he did that. And he did it over and over and over again. I made a list of all the cases that were dismissed. And I think the court can see that in the PSI. It is a long list. It is a profoundly long list. And while we see a list of cases in black and white, letters and numbers, and the word dismissed, it's a lot different to read that than to live that. Because every time he came into a courtroom, there was a chance he didn't leave. Every time he came into a courtroom, there was a chance he'd sit in a jail cell, that he'd go to prison, that he'd miss family, that he'd miss friends. But he did it anyway. And all of that is brave, and all of that should be applauded. The issue came with Mr. Brown's success. From my perspective, Mr. Brandt, by standing up and succeeding, received a number of things to include uh, fear and respect for those in power and also m monetary judgment. And when we experience success as humans, as people, there is uh, a, a temptation to say it's because we're special. It's because we are different. That we are given power or we are given a voice because of who we are, not what we stand for. And and that is that's the line, right? I think we've all seen the video. It was a disturbing video. I, I think it was probably a year or so ago when Mr. Brandt talked about guns and shooting people. It didn't happen. He didn't do it himself. So I think he made clear he wouldn't do it himself, but there was a sort of call to arms, a dangerous call to arms. And that, that moment right there, our case, those things, those are the moments where a man who was a warrior for the unseen began to feel like he deserved the power. It's the very thing he fought against. It's the very thing that got him to that position in the first place. And it's incredibly profoundly human. There are police officers who believe that they get the power because they deserve the power, rather than we are stewards of power. We are briefly and temporarily holding a flame of power to protect other citizens. DAs struggle with it. There's a, a sort of group thing. Anyone who receives any measure of power struggles with that. And I think that this case is a reflection of that. I think this case is a reflection of a man 
he was un unseen, he became angry, he fought back, he was a warrior for social justice, but let it go to his head. And so you, there is an argument, certainly. I'm, I'm not saying that there's not, and the court, you know, it's 17 is the court's purview. You could certainly incarcerate him. But the thing uh, that I kind of go back to, and I, I think that over the last few days in, in particular I've gone back to, is um, this reflection on the Reconstruction era in, in American history. Um, we don't have to, um, nor should we, doubt. We don't have to hobble a man to find justice here. We don't have to do that. We don't have to use the prison system in an answer to this conduct. The conduct is criminal. The conduct is human. The conduct can be corrupted because we've identified at least an option for solving it. And so uh, from my personal perspective, I don't think a prison sentence is necessary. I don't think it's warranted. I don't think that we need to deepen distrust and hate. The country is, is, is more tribalistic than I've ever seen it. It's incredibly disappointing. And unless people stand up and walk toward the middle and say, I see you, I don't need to cancel you, I don't need to throw away the keys and throw you in prison, I don't need to defund these people, I recognize there are good people. Unless we all get somewhere where we can recognize the humanity in each other, I don't know how we move forward. And so uh, th that is my, my reason for not requesting a prison sentence in this case. The other thing I would point out, which I think the court would rightfully be concerned about, to the extent the court is aware, um, is the difference in the Now, I know the defense attorneys oftentimes say, you yeah, can't consider that. And that's not true. Under a case called Bender, V-E-N-D-O-R, a case called Paul Whiteman, um, and I can get you all the citations for these. Um, I have it on my laptop, but I can pull them up on my phone. The court can consider them. Not as convincing, certainly, not as proven, um, but the fact that they were police contact in the context of similar purposes, can. Um, but what I would encourage, encourage the to do when you consider these pending cases, I think there might be four, it is also consider all of the cases. And I made a list of those cases, and I, I I didn't know we were going to start so late, so I was at, so going to read them. Um, but I'm not going to do that now. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, just to get into the story, I first question. I read the entire report, and that was a so I, I'm familiar with it. Okay. Um, and so it, it's a very long report. And so when we consider <laughs> the cases that are pending against Mr. Brand, uh, we should also consider all of the cases where he had to, to sit in a jail cell he had to sit in a courtroom with corrosive anxiety and not know what was going to happen. Um, and only by his courage to push the envelope did he walk out of that courtroom. And what he received was a monetary judgment for his time in custody, a monetary judgment for lost days and lost moments. And so I do think that both of those things are fairly considered together. With respect to um, the, the nature of the community sentence, I believe that the defense is going to ask for some sort of jail and close. Um, I, I don't know if that's true. Okay. If that is the case, I, I, I deeply disagree with that. I will tell you, I, I don't think it, it's helpful to not have him under supervision. And here's the reason where I'm kind of drawing the line. Um, you know, it is human to fail. We try and we fail, and we try to get better and we fail, and we hope that every day maybe we're a little bit better than the day before. But people people regret, people backslide. That's why we have recovery for it. We accept it and we work with it. Uh, I don't expect him to leave the courtroom and say, you know, gee, Wilford, I'm never going to do any of this again. It's going to be better now. I'm, I'm a whole person. Uh, there is a lot of hurt we have to heal. There's a lot, there's a lot. And it's going to take some time. And if he, if he continues to threaten people, well, I mean, we might, we might work ourselves into a pretty lengthy process of time. Uh, but at this time, I think if we have him under supervision and we try to target those things, 
in a community-based, uh, I guess, situation. Um, that is something I do, I, I do agree with. The last thing I'll say um, with respect to, I guess, the harm, the, the, the harm with this conduct, and, and I, part of it is for the court to hear, but part of it is for Mr. Brown to hear. Um, when we use words, as a lawyer, I'm not very good at math. Numbers don't mean a ton to me, but words matter. How they're said matters. How many times you speak them matters. The feeling behind them matters. And Mr. Brant may not have any intention to harm a fly, and I believe that. I do. I, I don't think he hurt anybody. But it doesn't matter because he has a platform and he uses his words and he's smart. And God forbid one person gets injured because he's mad and he throws a fit. I think they're fit. Again, due to the power issue. If one person is injured, you can't take that back. You gotta live with that for the rest of your life. And that family has to live with that person take hold in their life. And that's not okay, and that's too good of a risk to take. And so I'm happy to try treatment. I'm not asking the court or Mr. Brandt to not protest. But it's got to be done responsibly. Because every single person matters. Even if he thinks that they abuse power, like I think that he abused power in some of these posts, I'm not calling for lynching. I'm not calling for an incarcerated sentence. I'm listening. I try to listen to Mr. Brandt. I try to hear his hurt and hear his words. And I hope that this justice process, if we are honest and we are transparent and we are good and we are kind and we work hard and we fight, that maybe we can change lives. Not only for our sentence. My hope is that he sees that you don't have to respond to abuse of power with more power, with more money. And so that is why I am requesting a community-based sentence with an emphasis on mental health. Well, let me ask, a community-based sentence, as far as I'm aware, the only option is probation, correct? Yes, sir. And are you requesting a specific length for probation? I do think a lengthier term of probation is appropriate. And the hope is, you know, at some point, probation becomes a missing return. It's very difficult with, for people without cars um, or without steady streams of income to comply with probation. Um, so I'm not asking for a lengthy term with the idea that I'm going to hobble him in some way. My hope is that at some point, he may not need our supervision. And he can work with his probation officer and apply for early termination. And I'm not the DA that's going to object to object. I will hear him. I will see what he's done. I will look at his track record. And if he earns a way out early, I'm fine with that. Well, all, all that's fine. I mean, it's to go to supervise on to you, but it's to terminate early. Right. My question for you is, if you haven't, you can tell me what it is. If you don't, that's fine. Is it three years? Is it four years? Is it two years? Is it ten? What is it? Four years. Four years. Okay. And you're asking for jail. I'm not. And, and let me kind of tie up a loose end as well. We have this other count in this case that has a six month uh, jail sentence. Yes. That was suspended on the condition that he completes the deferred. Now, your motion when you filed it was not to impose that jail sentence, it was to revoke the deferred. Do you want that just hanging around out there, or what do you want to do with that? If that was actually, I, I didn't, I, I'm a candidate, I didn't recall that that was hanging out there. Well, I think it is, because it was on, uh, it was on count, additional count five, uh, six months jail suspended upon successful completion of the conditions that you deferred. <clears throat> now, again, your motion didn't address it. I'm suggesting the bigger picture of the felony conviction here. On the other hand, and if you want to just leave that alone, fine, I guess it's sitting there, possibly motion we found at a later time to impose it, although it's pretty clear I've already found that the deferred was, was violated. Right. So I'm not saying I'm looking for a portrait. I'm just saying, are you aware of that? What do you want to do about it? I wasn't aware of that. Um, 
Just that on my on my okay. second one. So I, if I just talk sometimes, no, no one makes their best record. <laughs> okay, fine. All right, you want something else that you need to? I guess you can't because you don't have your stuff up. But thank you. It's still a thought. All right. Uh, so you can't do. You can proceed whatever order you want to. It's Brad just so we're clear. You have the right to make a statement to the court. You're not required to. That is totally up to you. You have an absolute right in addition to your attorney's argument and so forth, to make a statement if you want to. And again, in what order that occurs is usually something you and your attorney decide. Okay? Ms. McKenzie? Um, and, Your Honor, I'm hoping the court has received the social work report I sent. I sent it back. Mitigation report? Um, yeah. Yeah, I read that. Okay. I read it on, like, that originally, and I read that again this morning. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, yeah. And, and, and let me just say right now, I'm going to say a lot about why a prison sentence is justified, but I'm not going to sentence Mr. Grant to prison. I don't know if that reads your argument or not, but it's very, very rare when the people ask me to use a community-based sentence, and I say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. So, go ahead. I will curtail my remarks. I think that's the guidance the court is giving me. We essentially join in that request for a community sentence. My proposal to the court, if the court was inclined to impose some sort of intermediate sanction between probation and DOC, which I think is our only other option here, would be to, sorry, would be to use some of that suspended sentence. I don't think the court is required to impose all of this pursuant to the Sierra case. Um, but On the count I just talked about. Correct. Um, but I think the court could impose some amount of a county jail sentence as a condition of probation or relevant to either misdemeanor count in this case um, as an in-home detention sentence is going to be my request of the court. And I also wanted to let the court know it's Mr. Grant's request that the court impose probation but add the condition of he has to meet with Mr. Mir, who I believe is calling in uh, at least once a week as the therapist he's presently working with. He's a licensed clinical social worker based in the Trinidad. Um, I have a much longer argument, but that's essentially the, the nothing bolts that we were joining in that request. He does have 31 days of pre-sentence credit that I calculated. I guess we're going to live east and rest in two six-month sentence, but, but otherwise, no, I, I do think Mr. Grant needs supervision. I, I think he needs to know that if he, he just can't find a day of kind of in the line here is that you've got this possible picture of prison report. You know, I think that's the important here. So if the idea of no we're just going to, you know, give you jail time and I don't know what you're saying with felony, then 90 days probation would terminate after 90 days in jail or something. That's not my request. Okay. I, I'm asking for a supervised probationary term. Okay. I'm just uh, suggesting if the court would like to... I, I, I don't feel compelled to put him in jail. He's been in jail a lot. Uh, a punishment is certainly justified in this case, again, I'll address that a little bit more in a minute. On the other hand, uh, and even more so now during this pandemic, you know, this sort of don't sit in jail for a while. I don't know what that adds to this thing. It doesn't add much more to this I, I just, I thought the court might want to add some sort of sanctions, so that's why I brought that up. Well, that could be a compromise. I think none, none of it asked for it. I'm, as I said, I'm not bound by the people's request, but it's been very, very rare that uh, you know what? I'm going to do something terribly different than the people who are asking. I understand the court's position. Um, Mr. Brandt, I think, does wish to address the court. Um, <laughs> Mr. Moore and also um, Edward Harris, who is uh, one of Mr. Brandt's other lawyers, should be on the phone. I gave them the number and asked them to work themselves initially. Um, so, what do you say? <laughs> One person is a counselor that you want to be a condition of this, and the other is the attorney in a case in Larimer County. Correct. And what would be the relevance of the sentencing of the attorney in Larimer County? He's also a civil attorney. It's my understanding that the court is signaling to us that the court is likely to agree with Ms. Easton's sentencing request and not impose any additional bail. Given that, I'm not sure we do need to call Mr. Mears. Absolutely. Okay, you want to do that now? Before, and I'm not sure when you say he's called in or he's in the queue or what the status is. We'll figure that out in a minute. But Mr. Brandt's going to make his statement now. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, when, uh, when my co defendant, Mr. Brown, was charged with the Facebook post, he was a Houston role, that was that I immediately took the stand to take accountability for this post. I'm under oath, and so to my actions, they were my actions. I am here to on this case, and I think that um, there's two very important things that have come out of this case. Uh, number one is 
I'll say that the, the, the most global question is that Miss Houston has always been my partner on this case. She was there for me when I turned myself into Diversion. She uh, worked with Diversion with me, and I think that Diversion was overall very successful for me. And when, when I filled out the packet for Diversion, uh, Mr. Moon and Ms. Houston were surprised that I had admitted to the, the program that I had a substance abuse. Um, he is the icon of everything we want government to be. He truly does do it. And if everybody would like to be then I would not have a government. <laughs> so I want to thank you. And it's important because I know a lot of people are watching this. And a lot of people look at me and think, oh, he's going to go out on the street and talk to everybody. And, and that's not what I believe. And I think it's really important, not just for the court and the people to say that, but I think it's really important for everybody in fact. The one that works well in the people who to participate in it. And this is supposed to participate. So everything that she said is in, 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 in the great bulk of and I appreciate that. And I couldn't say that regardless of what sport school is. But uh, really, my thing. And uh, I took the word in period three. I guess. I guess I did. Um, I don't know how many hours of community service I did. But it was in the hundreds. Um, I would have just paid off all my court costs today if the window were open. <laughs> so I would pay all those that we paid. And I should have paid off. Um, I didn't have to pay a benefit. So um, I know she talked about receiving some monetary judgment. I don't think you guys understand how many bonds I have to pay. Well, I still owe my bonds and a lot. And, um, and what I want to talk to a little bit about some of the successes too, that I don't think it would have been possible to talk about. The perseverance and the the belief that there were people in the system that were there for all the right reasons. And she's not the only one, by the way. There's a lot of people out there. Um, I have made case law twice. And I'm, I'm honestly a little bit proud of that because I know attorney's salary to do that. Um, I think case law that it is in fact protected speech to distribute literature about the noise that takes the courthouse. And I am also the grant of grant for successful service to find strictly limits liability and total product is the fighting words in this to the bonus in the In fact, that particular is grant versus what Mr. Chuck finished after seven to six, seven years. So, and in the last, but one of the, it's in the personal side of things, I admitted to using substance abuse treatment, Ms. Houston and Mr. Moon, because it was time. I think this is what I said to at the time, too. They were surprised. It was time. It, and, and it didn't come, it didn't happen overnight. I was not that a lot, anyway. Um, that's not something that I haven't used. But I haven't used in well over a year now. And it took a long time. And I had to see therapy to do that. I had to be on line with sobriety to a and the other day, tell you how important it is. I went to the street for them to get the rest of my belongings there today. The most recent Lord is the big street. It was so nice. I was not there for five minutes that they were offering me bills and they were trying to sell me bills and I wasn't going to do any of that. They were trying to borrow money from me. Most of my belongings were destroyed or gone. And and I I don't want to have fun to be Substance abuse is not an issue. It's fine because I'm a lot of this variety anyway. And in fact, I might, on our case or other days, I might not make it to the monitors for the few days, but I do have to be like this from the future to the first time. Um, I <laughs> but I think monitor sobriety was important for me, by the way. I don't 
things that I would have done it without it. And, uh, and just to know this really is a good thing. Um, then when I was in jail last year for like, what, six or seven months, Jefferson uh, County has a big group of And I asked for that pod. And it normally takes like months to get over there. And I put me over there right away. I was there for all the three weeks of the time that I was there. And I was 100% compliant with the program. And then I get out of custody with COVID, and everything is completely screwed up. And, um, and so I ended up living out in Manzanola right now. Um, I have a great support network. I have a place to be with support and quarantine, so it's house arrest. Those people are wanting me to be there, and I want to be there. And it's great because they really find me to get to them, and it's really wild with the food. So I'm like, I've been recognizing the like, 
and I'm working with this, you know, ketamine team, um, I think that I've found a way to use my power, if you want to call it that. I don't really think I have all this power, but uh, to use my power in ways that are contributing to, uh, to our community so that, so that hopefully our children can inherit a system that at least know we're talking to one of And so those are the things that I wanted to say. And I just want to end by uh, repeating how great this is. It's really bad thing. And, uh, you know, also say that I've been completely satisfied with my attorney's representation. I do think that she's fantastic. She uh, has bought some things that I would have just given into because she thinks it's important for the system to go through all the motions. And, and I know that Nick, you can understand that. We would see some prophecy here that maybe people are irritated about, but I think it's important to do. Uh, and, and I think that she is fantastic. So, that's all I want to say. I want to ask the court to allow me the opportunity to continue on the positive progress that I need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, well, let me just clarify about Mr. Mayor. So first of all, I assume you're going to ask that your probation transferred to that county or supervision, because that's where you're living now. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I don't know what probation will look like or how much it is, it is four hours away. Uh, I'm currently living in Crowley County. As a matter of fact, when I look out the door, if I look that way, I see the Portland prison, and if I look that way, I see the Crowley prison. But I'm thinking that I'm probably going to be able to well, go there. We're not going to go all that today. I'm just oh, asking that, uh, in other words, most people, yeah. that's up to you. you know, don't want to be coming here to... to programming that I guess I could do another county. So and I guess somewhere incumbent in that is that you're if you're meeting with Mr. Mayors, that you're probably gonna be in that community. Is that what you're saying? I would say that. I would say I'm not allowed to live on my property until I have a separate system. Okay. So I've begun that process, but I'm probably not gonna be able to actually live on my property until spring. So Mr. Mears is in what? He is in Trinidad. He's in Trinidad. Yeah. So I'm currently living in Crowley County, so if it's possible to... I, mean, okay. I don't know what the intensity is. If they're doing most things by remote anyway, then I'm... Uh, if there's any support needs me to move to to accomplish this, then I guess so, I... So, and Mr. Kennedy, let me ask you that. Then, uh, you said that, well, we, we, we should get the mental health evaluation and treatment. I don't know if she agrees, but I just say he doesn't need to be evaluated with the with the mirror is, is adequate. Is that what your request is? Okay. Okay. All right. Is he submitting any rebuttal and or addressing the six month jail time? <laughs> Um, I don't have any rebuttal. I'm glad that Mr. Brandt talked about all the things that were going right. I think I wouldn't have any access to a lot of that information. I'm not sure that the court would. But I'm glad to hear that he's still trying to make the community better um, by working with legislators, legislators on things. But I think that that's great. Um, it, just, it just can't be can't be threatening when you do it. You can't put other people at risk, is my only um, With respect to the, to the jail sentence, um, I'm not asking for that to be imposed. Um, what I'd ask is that the court, um, you know, we, it's maintained on the minimum. Um, there's pre-sentence confinement credit that's available. Um, and if we have to come back and look at an incarcerative opportunity for, I'm sorry, alternative, then I think we can impose it at that time. Ultimately, understanding it's up to the court, uh, what the court chooses to do. Let me just make sure I understand that so the record's clear. On the one hand, that could mean, well, it's, it's been determined that Mr. Grant did not complete the sentence of his first sentence. Therefore, that sentence could be imposed yeah. now or at a later time. Or, I guess we could you could ask me to modify that the conditions of the suspension uh, of that sentence to now comply with this probation sentence. And I'm not trying to steer you over there, I just think we need to clear about that. The, the second option, the latter. Um, okay. uh, amending it to uh, specifically rather than compliance 
with the DJ compliance with the probation agent. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The court will be following the uh, findings and orders uh, concerning the sentencing. Uh, and, and again, I, I think I made clear where I'm headed here, but I think it, it's also important to say some of this for the record. Uh, the defendant was originally charged with three counts uh, of attempt to influence a public servant. Uh, one was Judge Delgado, another one was a social worker, Mr. Anderson, and a third one, a uh, third count of retaliation against the judge, the victim being uh, Judge Delgado. Those were all class four felonies. And uh, the defendant uh, originally pled not guilty and set those matters for trial, but uh, eventually then he uh, chose to uh, enter a guilty plea to count one uh, against the influence of public servant, uh, that being Judge Delgado. And counts two and three were dismissed. Additional count five, obstructing governmental operations, and guilty plea to that, that involved the six months suspended jail sentence. Uh, and then uh, additional count six uh, about interference with school operation where there was a, a fine imposed. Uh, again, the conditions were for the deferred sentence. And again, this was a, a, a very good offer uh, to him, gave him an opportunity to successfully comply with that, and if so, then withdraw his guilty plea. Uh, but he had a three year deferred sentence with a number of conditions that he was dissatisfied. Motion was filed uh, about a year after he entered that plea, asking the uh, question of course to revoke the deferred sentence based on several criminal uh, conditions. The <laughs> court found that those uh, conditions did occur. He had violated the term. And uh, again, there's that this matter for sentencing. So, considerations for sentencing, and, and both counsel have, have touched on most, most of those. Um, but first, we have to consider what is the offense here, and, and as Ms. Uh, <coughs> has said, you know, this is um, attempt to influence Judge Soldado, uh, who is a public servant. She's a district court judge. Uh, at this particular time, she was presiding over a child uh, dependency and neglect case. Uh, and uh, again, the elements of that offense would include by threat of violence against her person or property and with the intent to alter or affect that judge's decision or action concerning that case. So, again, that, that was all discussed at the time. The defendant was pled guilty to that. Uh, that is the offense. It's a serious offense. Uh, as noted by Ms. Easton, and obviously this court agrees with the judge, the court understands that the, the persons, whether it's the persons involved in the case or others, are often unhappy with a particular case or the case has been filed or the outcome of the case or what the sentence is or whether the person's children are, are taken away from them temporarily or permanently. And that, unfortunately, is, is a byproduct of the, of the court system. And as Ms. Eason said, do we do it works perfectly each and every time? Not necessarily. I'm not that arrogant as, as well. But it is a very good uh, system of justice. And the reason these offenses exist is judges can't do their job or others in a climate of, well, I'm going to be threatened. Uh, I'm going to be threatened with violence. And why is that being done? Because, Judge, we want you to make a decision that that we believe is correct, not one you believe is correct after hearing the evidence and, and following necessary procedures. That simply cannot uh, uh, occur. It is, it is totally inappropriate. Uh, and Mr. Brandt acknowledges that that's totally inappropriate. He may not acknowledge it at the time. He's quite guilty. I think he acknowledges it now. Hopefully he does. The next factor, of course, to consider is you know, who is the defendant? Uh, well, that's a complex question in this case, or a complex answer. Again, I've read the mitigation report. I've read the um, pre-sentence uh, report in the other case that was used in this case. We don't need to be like your entire history, Mr. Grant. I think the has outlined a good deal of it, and he's probably accurate. Um, you have difficulties. Uh, a lot of people do. Uh, how do you deal with them? That's why people are often in court. Uh, up to, looks like, somewhere around 
2011 or 12, you weren't in the court system with any regularity. Uh, again, at some point, uh, your you know your way of approaching what you saw as injustice or how you're going to shift the balance of power and so forth changed. Uh, and, and and it became, you know, first of all it became uh, demonstrations and so forth, and it escalated into this sort of uh, behavior, this behavior. Meaning again, this is done, I think, on a Facebook page, page or your YouTube at the time of this particular case. And so obviously, whether you know it was a mental health issue, it was substance abuse, it was you know the influence of others. I don't know, uh, but. Uh, the bottom line is, it was a road that got you into a lot of uh, history with the court. Uh, there are many, many convictions here. There are many cases dismissed, uh, no doubt about it. There are many convictions uh, as well. They are all misdemeanors uh, up to the time of this case. That doesn't mean that's a good thing. I mean, some of them are for things like uh, third-degree assault uh, uh, or uh, trespass and so forth. That is your criminal history. There's no doubt about it. It's a long criminal history. And what I'm hearing today from not only Ms. Easton, but you, and, and I will say, yes, Ms. Easton has been as much of an advocate for you as any prosecutor I have ever seen in the case. Uh, she's, I mean, she's been extremely fair, and I think that's a good thing, as you noted. I don't know that every prosecutor has to deal with the case that way in order to be a good and fair prosecutor. I think she's gone well beyond that, but she's tried as hard as she could to be fair to you to recognize why you're in the court system. Are there better ways to, to treat your situation than simply putting you in jail? Uh, and, and, and I agree with her about some of that, although, again, I, I also have to look at the fact that you know, the, the pre-sentence report that was filed in this case, you know, I think you would have said in, in the uh, Jefferson County case was a mess, I guess that's why that could give you a jail sentence. I know it's on a field in the district court there or whatever, but and they weren't real optimistic about your ability to be supervised in the case, or that you wouldn't do the same sort of criminal behavior again. I have to assume that's why instead of putting on probation, that's what that judge did. I don't have to agree with that judge, but that's that's, that's what probation was saying there. I can tell you what his reason was. Well, you told me that. That, no, I don't, yeah, we don't need to get into that. But the, the bottom line is, I mean, one of the things the court is to consider is rehabilitation. Can the person be rehabilitated? And I can't say how many times, Mr. Grant, I've had defendants appear in front of me and say, Judge, you know, I'm a new person. And, well, you won't see me here again. And many, many times I don't see them again. <laughs> but they don't all succeed. And it's quite frankly, right, people are inclined to tell the court anything it, it takes if they think will avoid a severe sanction, like a prison sentence. I'm not saying that's you. It's just what I'm saying is the only person who really knows that you can alter your behavior is you. So these things, she looks into your situation, she believes that's the case, but she can't change your behavior. When I say change your behavior, meaning it cannot escalate to this kind of level of, of felony against judges and public servants. That's different than I'm standing in a protest for the time, and, or I'm saying something uh, exercised by right of free speech that doesn't cross the line to a threat to go somewhere. So, the reason we <laughs> that probation supervision, certain conditions of that will work for you, I'm willing to go along, and I hope we're all right, uh, because as she says, none of us What's a situation where you inflame somebody else? Your rhetoric may be something you don't intend to carry out anyway. Mm -hmm. But there's other people out there who aren't as smart as you do, who don't think the same way as you do, who hear this, and they go off and carry out those kinds of things. That is the huge danger of this. And this is far different than making a statement directly to someone. All you do is walk up to the judge, for instance, and say, I think you should have this done. Uh, that's far different than going out in a public forum and saying that to other people who get them riled up and so forth. Because now we've brought all them in as possible for The court is considered punishment. There's no question that 
sacrifice that would be warranted for this. I'm not going to punish you, but it would be warranted just to make clear to the record that that was, that's, that's the, the case. And, and 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 why? Well, one, it's a class four felony. It's not a misdemeanor. Uh, two, again, if you look at this, there's a lot of probation sentences, a lot of jail, and so forth. And again, the question becomes: At what point do we have to? increase the punishment to get something across. When I say to get something across, it does two things. One is the public safety issue. If we remove you from the public, well, at least during that period of time, you can't be doing harm to somebody. Secondly, there's a deterrent effect, hopefully for you and others, if we say, you know, if you do this, what happens is there's a severe punishment for that. And, I mean, again, this, this offense does justify this. I have no idea what will happen in your other cases, whether you're going to be convicted, whether you're going to plead, what other judges. I can only deal with this case here. The reason I'm willing to go along with this uh, sentence is, I think I made clear to you before, and why I, I continue this, is that look at that report, look at that I don't think prison accomplishes much of anything other than removing you from the public so you can't harm people during that period of time, punishing you. And maybe sending a deterrent message to others is most super important, but it's very seldom rehabilitating an individual. And there are better ways to do that. And you are seem to be committed to that. You know, you're getting counseling, you're you saying you're removing yourself to more remote locations, maybe you don't get tied up with the same individuals or the same kind of thing. Well, I think that'd be a good thing for you because this is all down the front range. You know, where these cases are. And again, uh, that's why we're here in, 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 in this case. So, uh, having considered those factors, I, I do think an appropriate sentence uh, is a probation sentence. I do think it should be uh, fairly lengthy, uh, you know, over four years. Uh, and again, the reason is that, you know, if you can't succeed on this, I'm not saying that that has to be your sentence or it's predetermined that you go to prison. But again, we're going to run out of options here. You cannot you know, stay in the community, be supervised, and remain law by this. That's the standard condition of any probation sentence. So I think it's king, you know, a, a, an outlined situation from the probation department to say exactly what we think Mr. Grant needs to follow up. But I don't think there's any question that you need mental health counseling. Whether that's done by Mr. Mears or someone else, I don't know if Mears could be done disabled, we just say, who knows. But I, I'm going to order you to continue with Mr. Mears or someone else acceptable to the probation department, whatever probation department is supervising you at that time. Um, Ms. Eastern, you were not asking me for any kind of substance abuse evaluation. Um, so, such evaluation or treatment as they may be necessary. Yes. Okay. It is so ordered, which means I'm going to leave that probation because I have having a chance to advise you here and say, you know, go down that, or we set this, or we talk to counselor from Methodist, you know, whatever it was, standard conditions. You know, you either need to be employed or looking for a job or in school or to the extent of your disability. I mean, those are all the ideas that are disability compensation. I, I understand. I don't know if that means you're totally disabled and can't work. But the bottom line is probation, that is one of the things people are supposed to be doing who are on probation. It is for a number of reasons, including the fact that too much time and time uh, often gets people in trouble for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if they determine that that isn't reasonable for you because of your disability, then so be it. But I'm just telling you, all the standard terms and conditions, and there are probably, I've come to look at least two dozen standard terms and conditions of probation 
where that right to appeal, anything in this case, would require 49 days from today's day. And you discuss that with the lawyer if you want to. And if you can be, if you wish to appeal, and that's not you going to do it, you need to file a further motion to report. Anything else from the people? Anything else from the press? Thank you, Your Honor. Hold on just a second here. So this is a report to the probation department down below the parking lot? That's just exactly what I'm asking. It goes about now about prison reform is going on over here. Okay. So we have you signed. Yes, I've got the document. And you just heard what she said about you. You finally have to report to them. Yes. And again, if you want to take that supervision transmitting to another county, you take that up to the probation officer. It's not something that requires. And you are authorizing transfer to another county? I am authorizing. We're assuming that they agree. We're assuming that other county agrees. You know, you're assuming that some remote county says, you know, we're not really prepared to handle this. They're all a little bit particular with the prison. Well, or very cold it is. Whatever it might be. But the bottom line is that's an inter-county probation decision that I have no objection to. Would it in any way surprise you to learn that I was at a gas station in Crowley County and there was an unmarked lawn service truck at the gas station? And the guy came around his truck and I wasn't even dressed in my truck. And he said, hey, Mr. Brandt, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. How are you?